and welcome to church this morning. Whether you are a visitor here today or a regular attender, you're very welcome in this place. My name is Shannon Wilkinson and it's my joy to be the youth coordinator at Bankway West Church. This morning we will worship God through singing, prayer and the reading and teaching of his word. I'm going to open a prayer and then we will stand to sing our first song. So let's pray together. From Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together this morning. Thank you that we can come together as a family, a church family, to worship you. Father, some of us are here distracted from all that has gone on this week. Would you still our hearts before you? Some of us have faced suffering and illness. Would you help us to feel your comfort this morning? Some of us are full of joy that we have made it to the summer holidays. Would you help us to feel the blessing of resting in you? Thank you that you are good and that you are our Lord and our King. And we give you thanks that your love endures forever. Amen. Amen. If you're able, please stand and sing with us as the band leads us.
husband and I are doing the children's talk this morning. Bye. Last week, the children's talk was about a man of God, a prophet, and he helped, through a miracle of God, a widow who was very poor by providing lots of olive oil. Now, I know maybe some of you weren't here last week, but just a wee quiz to begin. Um, I've got three possible prophets' names for you. I've got Elijah, Elisha, and Isaiah. So, just have a guess, even if you weren't here last week, okay? Who, hands up who thinks the prophet's name from last week is Elijah? Okay, right, good. And what about Elisha? Uh -huh. How about Isaiah? Well, the majority got it. It was Elisha. Yeah, well done, well done, well remembered. And today's story is about Elisha as well. And Elijah's house is over here, and Ruth is Elisha, and Rachel is Elisha's servant. Okay, and there's one other person who's quite important in this story, and his name is Naaman. Now, Naaman is a very important person. He is the commander of the Syrian army. Could I have maybe two volunteers to be Naaman's soldiers, please? <laughs> Now, as I said, Liam is really important, commander of the army of Syria next door to Israel where Elijah lives, but he's also very sad. He's got a horrible skin disease that is getting worse and worse, and nobody can help him. But he's heard about Elijah, how Elijah is doing wonderful things with God's help. And so he, with his soldiers and his chariots and his horses, travel from Syria to Israel and they find Elisha's house. So he's at Elijah's house, fooling, expecting Elijah to come out and do something wonderful. But Elisha doesn't come out. His servant comes out and the servant says, Go and wash in the Jordan River seven times and you'll be cured. Who does it think I am? Oh, I'm the commander of the Syrian army. Why didn't he just come out and say some magic word to, to get rid of this? Oh, that's, that's terrible. And why do I go and wash in that murky river yet? The rivers at home are so much better. Syrian rivers are clean. <laughs> oh, no. I'm going to go home. This is ridiculous. You should have come out to me, the commander. <laughs> mm. So you can see, he wasn't very pleased. But one of his soldiers, <laughs> soldiers said, if he'd actually do something really difficult, he'd have done it. Why don't you just do this simple thing that he's asked? So he was a sensible man, so he thought about it, and with his soldiers and his chariots and his horses, he went to the Jordan River. And he got into the river. Four, 
all the parables are about God, Israel, and Jesus. So this is just a setup. So there is a king, and the story is going to be about the king who goes away for a while. However, if we were to skip ahead in the story and not read it out for you, we would know that this noble man who goes away to be appointed king is known as hard, greedy, and he's known as violent, he's known as murderous, the kind of things that he does go completely against the last life and words of Jesus who's been trying to reveal who God is and what he's like. And in fact, all this collection of stories that lay out the story of God and his creation and God and his people don't portray a God like that. So this is not a parable about what God is like. As Jesus is telling this story, his listeners, when they hear about a man of noble birth who went to a distant country to have himself appointed king, this is not just a setup or a parable. This is a commentary on something that has just happened in their situation. Next slide. And four years before <clears throat> roughly the, the, the rough date of Jesus' birth, um, although in actual fact Jesus was actually born, we think about 4 or 6 BC. Try and get your head around that because BC means before Christ. Anyway, <laughs> whoever did the dating didn't get it quite right. Never mind. There was a king, the king of the Jews, known as Herod the Great. He wasn't descended from the right actual tribe that kings tended to come from, and he wasn't appointed in the normal way by being a priest or a prophet anointing his head. Instead, he volunteered, if you like, because he was rich and he was powerful, to look after this part of the Roman Empire on behalf of the Romans. And he went to Rome to be confirmed as king, and he was confirmed as king. He then operated as a puppet king. He was Jewish. He built the temple, he built the palace, but no one thought he was a legitimate king, and nobody thought he operated like a king. He was despised. He then had three sons, and he divided up the kingdom, and one of them was known as Herod Archelaus. And he did the same thing. So to get his piece of the kingdom, he went to Rome to be confirmed as the king. When he got there, he found that a whole lot of people who despised him, because he'd already treated people horrifically across the area, from the Jewish nation had gone to Rome to campaign that he not be allowed to become king. In actual fact, the Romans decided to make him not king, but put him in charge. He wasn't allowed the name king. He came back and he was furious with those who tried to stop him being in charge and he murdered all of his enemies, which wasn't the only time that he murdered huge groups of people. So he was despised. So when Jesus tells his first century listeners a story about a noble man who goes away to be appointed king, they know exactly who he's talking about. And he doesn't have to use that person's name to be talking about. This is not just a nice story to try and illustrate something. This is a commentary on what is happening in the day and deeply subversive at the same time. Next slide. It's layered on. And this is exactly what happened, as Jesus goes on and says, well, this man's subjects hated him, and they sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to king. He was put in charge, and then he came back. Exactly what happened. His listeners would have a wry smile as they listened to Jesus' story. Next one. But Jesus adds more, adds more layers to the story. Because the parable isn't about just one thing. It isn't ever about just getting across a message, or challenging, or provoking one set of questions. This man has given some of his servants responsibility. He's given them some of his money and said, do something with it. So then, as he comes back, he challenges them to show what they've done. Next slide. He's given them while they're away responsibility. And another layer to this story is the fact that the Israelite people believed that their God had in some ways abandoned them because they had forgotten who their God was, that they were in exile because they had forgotten how to be the people God had made them to be, but one day their God would come back. And meantime, they were waiting and crying out. And this is a story about people who are <coughs> waiting, but these people have been given responsibility. Next slide. The first servant, there's 10 servants we're told about, but we only hear actually about three. First one comes back and says, well, I've doubled your money. And he says, that's excellent. Because you've done that, I will put you in charge of 10 cities. Often we very quickly read this story and say, someone who's done a good job gets a reward. Next slide. Notice he doesn't get a reward, he gets more responsibility. Because he can take 
care and he's trustworthy in one area, he's actually given responsibility in another. And this is another layer to what Jesus is often saying, that people who are God's creation are actually created for a task, to love their neighbours, to love their God, to look after the world they were put in, and also to be part of bringing that world to its fruition, to its potential, that we're made for responsibility. And here he's challenging again, this servant had responsibility and then was given more responsibility. And there's another layer in this as well, because that's what kings are supposed to do, and this king obviously hasn't. Next one. We heard about one other who gets um, half as much, and then we don't hear about the other seven, but we hear about the last servant who says, here is what you gave me, I was terrified of you. I put it in, next slide, in the Greek, uh, sweaty hanky, because that's what it would be. Anything you had in your pocket wrapped up would have been for wiping off the sweat. All he's done, because of fear, is keep it because he's terrified of this man. Terrified of taking a risk. Next slide. We then get the nobleman's response. He's like, why didn't you even just put it on deposit? And again, Jesus' listeners should be laughing at this point because in the Jewish law, you're not actually supposed to lend money in interest unless you do it to a foreigner. So he's adding another commentary on all the different ways that people are twisting and using the different ways that God has given them. Why didn't you put my money on deposit so that I could have got it with interest? Then he says to them, well, take this away from him. Give it to the one who earned more. And lots of people in the crowd say that this is, this is unfair. Next slide. The man who's the last servant, or the one we hear about, was paralyzed with fear. But he then misses out. What he has is taken away from him. Next slide. The noble man is furious and he is incredibly violent. He says, everybody who has more will be given. So those who've taken responsibility will get more responsibility. Even those who have given stuff before, they're going to have that taken away. And these enemies of mine, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Again, it's exactly what happened in history. Just to underline that this is not a story about God and about how God deals with us. It's not a story that says, oh, in Jesus' way of thinking, in God's way of thinking, people who are rich get richer and people who are poor get poorer. Those are exactly the opposite of the kind of things that Jesus has been living out and acting out. This is instead a complex parable with all sorts of different layers that are poking all sorts of different responses and all sorts of different questions in different ways. Next slide. Jesus somehow has created a simple story that has a, a many different things. It's a commentary on what's actually happening at this time and a challenge to them. It's a challenge to the Jewish people listening, saying, actually, while you're waiting for your God to do something, you've been given responsibility, and what are you doing with it? Have you been part of what God's doing? Are you trying to move this kingdom project forward, or are you so terrified that you're too afraid to do anything at all, and in that case, you are going to miss out? There's another layer about the nobleman who's an unwanted king, and the fact that King Herod and his sons are unwanted kings and illegitimate kings, but alongside that, Jesus is being talked about as the king, and is he the real king that God has been promising? And all the way along, what Jesus has been doing in this story more than anything is provoking a response. A response and a challenge about the challenge of responsibility. Now I have one more question and that is, have I answered all your questions <laughs> about this passage? And I hope that the answer is no. Because the point, I believe, is not to have all the answers. The point is to be challenged. Challenged to respond and to come back time and time again. And I am happy, next slide, that there will be more questions than answers. Let's take a couple of minutes to see how that sits with us in quiet. Mm -hmm.